Advantages are key to the 66 system. And what makes them unique is about how they can be combined. Let's take a look at this character sheet. This is Drax the Chain. Drax is a fantasy character, but this could easily be a science fiction character or a horror character because 66 is a genre system. You can play it any setting you like. Drax has about 17 different advantages. They're a unique combination because every character has a different selection of advantages which they choose a character creation. And when Drax wants to do anything, he picks those advantages which fit with what he's trying to do, combines them, rolls the dice which are described by the advantage, and he succeeds or he fails. It is a very simple and straightforward system. There are no rules about which advantages can be combined with which other advantages. So who decides? How do you decide whether one advantage can work with another advantage? Well, the first rule is common sense. Most of the time it's blatantly obvious whether something can be or cannot be combined together. For instance, if Drax wants to climb a cliff, then using his climb and his brawn is a perfectly sensible combination. No one is going to worry about that. But what happens if the suggested combination isn't common sense, isn't straightforward? So this is Drax deciding to use his climb, his brawn and his toughness. What happens then? Here the rest of the group gets involved. They get to decide whether a combination is appropriate. And the first thing to do is to actually look at the advantage concern. What does it actually say? And in this case, toughness just says hardiness and resilience. So, you know, you're sort of tough, you can endure things, you can take it. Now, it might not sound like that's an appropriate thing to use while climbing a cliff, but it depends. What if it's an ice cliff? What if it's freezing cold? Surely then toughness will be a really useful thing to help him climb the cliff. And this brings to the, a key point about advantages, is advantages are and their combinations are entirely situation driven. You cannot say ahead of time whether something is or isn't an appropriate combination. You can only say in this situation, right now, for this character, this combination does work or it doesn't work. The important thing here is it is the group who decides whether toughness in this instance is useful or not in climbing the cliff. It's not the player, it's not the game leader, it's not one person's idea of what the game should be. Because everyone around the table is affected by these decisions. So everyone needs to be involved, there has to be a consensus, there has to be a common sense about what works and what work doesn't work in your game. And this will vary depending whether you want to play a dirty, gritty, realistic game, or you're playing high fantasy, space opera, cinematic style. What you allow and don't allow is up to your group and what style of play you want. Let's look at an advantage in detail. First up at the top is this coloured bar. This is just to give you a clear visual reference as to what type of advantage it is and makes it easier to find on the character sheet. We have green bars for life advantages, blue for ability advantages, black for equipment advantages, and purple for character path advantages. A lot of the information on an advantage is clear and obvious. So here we have the title of the advantage and the summary or descriptive text of the advantage. Here are the keywords. The keywords are a shorthand way of telling you information about the advantage. Now the keywords can be purely descriptive, so it could be something like armour or skill. So they just tell you a little bit more about the general type of advantage it is. But they can also be game mechanic keywords. So they tell you certain things about what happens, about how the advantage is used within the game. Most noticeably are static as a keyword, which means you have to use static potential rather than dynamic potential to activate this advantage. Finally, there are the CP and the dice values. These are the crunchy bits of an advantage. CP stands for character points, and it's how many character points you have spent on this advantage. This is decided when you're creating the character, and you get to set how many CP you want from this advantage, and then you can increase that CP value later as you gain experience through play. The critical thing about the CP is that it drives your dice value, and the dice value is what you roll when you use this advantage. 
So the more CP you put it into advantage, the greater the dice value you have on an advantage, the more that advantage contributes to an action using it. Potential is simply how much your character can do, because you need one potential to activate one advantage, and if you do want to do an action combining three different advantages, you need to use a three potential. There are two types of potential, dynamic potential and static potential. Starting characters have four dynamic potential and two static potential. And the difference between them is that dynamic potential can only be used to activate dynamic advantages and static potential can only be used to activate static advantages. Dynamic advantages are things you have to think about doing, you know, conscious, thoughtful things, where static advantages cover things which are reflexive, instinct, things about the background of your character's history. Equipment is just another type of advantage, and most equipment is dynamic, because you have to think about the sword, you have to think about the pistol to use it properly. But not all equipment is dynamic. In fact, some equipment is a third type of advantage, known as a free advantage. As the name suggests, it's free, it doesn't cost potential to activate, and this is almost exclusively covered by armour, because armour you don't have to think about using. It's just there, you know, even if you're unconscious, your armour still works. So that is why it is a free advantage. In the 66 RPG, there are two modes of play, known as narrative and combat. They both work the same way and use the same mechanics, but the difference is, is that when characters are in combat, you have to pay a lot more attention to how they use their potential, and more importantly, how they get it back, because everything is of course about split second timing in combat, it's about being able to just get that extra dice to finish off the monster. Whereas a narrative, it's more laid back, more easy, you have more time to do things, so a character can just stop and rest halfway through doing a task, and so therefore we don't need to worry about their potential so much. In narrative, players have a luxury of focusing on individual actions and getting the best possible result out of their character and their advantages. To help us keep track of things, we use tokens for potential. It doesn't matter what you use as your tokens, but you need four of one type for your dynamic potential and two of another type for your static potential. When a character uses an advantage, we place a token on them just to keep track of how much potential is being used. So let us return to Drax and his climbing of a cliff. Now Drax is clearly going to use his climb, which is a dynamic advantage, so we place a dynamic potential on it. He's also going to use brawn, which is also a dynamic advantage, and he's also going to use his balance, so which is again a third dynamic advantage. So he places three dynamic tokens on each of those advantages. Having selected our advantages, we now add up the dice. So that's a 1d6 plus 0, a 1d6 plus 0, and a 1d6 plus 2, giving us 3d6 plus 2 in total. We roll that dice, add all the, everything up together, and that gives us our score, and our score will either beat or fail to beat the target we needed. Having done that, all our potential returns to our bank. One useful option a character has in narrative, which they don't have in combat play, is that they can concentrate. Concentrate is a way of using unused potential to increase the dice value of an action. So if we look at Drax, he's used three of his dynamic potential on his climb, his brawn and his balance. That leaves him one spare dynamic potential with which he can concentrate. That adds an extra d6 to his dice roll, so his action would have been 4d6 plus 2. This is a very useful option when a character doesn't have many advantages applicable for a situation, and even when they have no advantages, they can still concentrate on the task at hand and gain a D, at least a d6 out of it. The big thing about combat is you have to worry about recovering your potential. This isn't an issue in narrative because it's assumed you've got plenty of time and you've always got the opportunity to sit and have a rest for a couple of minutes. In combat, that's clearly not an option, so you have to be a lot more careful about what you spend your potential on and how you recover it. Drax has found himself in a fight, a pretty normal situation for Drax. It's the start of combat and the start of Drax's turn, 
So Drax starts with his four dynamic potential and two static potential already in his bank, all ready for action. And Drax wants to lash out with his chain and attack his enemy. Drax is going to spend dynamic potential to activate his spike chain, his weapon expertise and his brawn plus static potential to activate his bandit advantage. The dice value of those advantages are added up and come to 4d6 plus 7. Drax rolls those dice. And what he has to do is beat his opponent's score, who is doing exactly the same thing, defend himself. And the difference between Drax's score and his opponent's score is the amount of damage Drax does. All this potential is now spent and moves into the spent pile. But Drax can recover two dynamic potential each turn. So he recovers two dynamic potential and they move it back into his bank. This is not the end of Drax's turn. A character's turn doesn't end until they say so. So they can keep acting as long as they've got potential to do stuff. Now Drax could attack again. He's got enough potential to do exactly the same attack as he's already made. However, if he spends all his potential attacking, he will have nothing left to defend himself with and that will get him killed very quickly. So what Drax decides to do, quite sensibly, is to finish his turn there. As it happens, Drax wasn't attacked during the rest of his turn, so his potential is unchanged. And he still has one potential in his spent pile, so he chooses to recover that now. Drax now attacks, he uses his spike chain, his weapon expertise and his brawn, all of which use dynamic potential, for an attack for 3d6 plus 8. That potential moves into the spent pile, leaving him with just one dynamic potential in his bank. However, he's only recovered one dynamic potential this round, so he can now recover a second dynamic potential and move it across into his bank. Again, Drax has got the potential to do more, but he decides not to take any more actions this turn. However, what he is going to do is anticipate. Anticipate is an option within a combat situation, which allows you to anticipate what advantages you're going to need in the coming round. If you anticipate correctly, you effectively get to use those advantages for free. However, if you incorrectly anticipate and don't use those advantages, then you actually lose potential. Anticipating is a gamble. When it pays off, it pays off. But when it goes wrong, it goes badly wrong. So Drax chooses only to anticipate with one of his dynamic potential. And he chooses to anticipate with his spike chain. And to indicate this, he places one dynamic potential on his spike chain advantage. During the rest of the round, Drax is attacked. He's attacked by a 4d6 plus 4 blow, which he must defend himself against, otherwise he's going to be seriously hurt. His first line of defence is his chainmail shirt, which is worth a d6 plus 3, and more importantly, it is a free um, advantage, which means it doesn't cost him any potential to use. He then has his spiked chain, which he uses to try and defend himself to keep the opponent away and block their blow. This is the advantage he anticipated with, and it is also worth a d6 plus 3. He then you, throws in his weapon expertise with one more dynamic potential, just using his skill and experience to help defend himself. And finally he uses his last static potential to take advantage of his bandit background. This all adds up to 4d6 plus 8, which gives him a really good chance of escaping unheard against a 4d6 plus 4 attack. Having completed the action, the dynamic potential and static potential he used on his weapon expertise and his bandit advantages move across to the spent pile. However, he anticipated with his spike chain and that moves back to his bank. And this is the beauty of anticipation. If you correctly anticipate what you're going to use to defend yourself, you get a, fe you get a free use of that advantage. It's back round to Drax's turn, and he's in a difficult situation. He's only got one dynamic potential left and no static potential. So Drax chooses to do nothing. This is a special option where a character does nothing during their turn. The advantage of this is that they get extra potential back. So instead of recovering the normal two dynamic potential, Drax can now recover three potential, 
And also, that potential doesn't just have to be dynamic. It can be static potential as well, and it can be any mix of static and dynamic potential as long as the total doesn't go above 3. So Drax chooses to recover 3 dynamic potential. During the rest of the round, Drax is attacked again, but this time only for 2d6 plus 2. Drax decides to rely on his chainmail shirt, worth the d6 plus 3, and of course doesn't cost him any potential, and just to spend one potential on his spike chain, worth a d6 plus 3, to give him a 2d6 plus 3 defence. It's Drax's turn again, but now his opponent has moved away and Drax has to give chase. Drax has to move and that costs potential, but there's a choice here. Drax can make a walk, or as it's known, a mosey, to keep up with him. That costs one potential and guarantees a movement of up to three five-foot squares. Drax's other option is to run. It costs one dynamic potential, the same as a mosey, but you roll a d6 to see how far you go. This means you can go further than a mosey, or you can go less far. Doing a run also allows you to combine advantages with that d6. So if you run and you've got the speed and sprint advantages, you could maybe run for 3d6 and go obviously go quite a lot further. Drax doesn't have any advantages like sprint or speed, so he decides just to mosey. And he's going to make use of his spike chain and one of the keywords on it, which is extended melee. This allows him to attack people in an extra square away, so they don't have to be adjacent. So Drax can mosey up and then still reach his opponent with a melee attack. Drax pays his one dynamic potential to do the mosey and then he recovers two dynamic potential back to his bank. Drax now decides it's time to go for broke and to put his opponent down for good. So Drax spends all his dynamic potential on this attack. This involves spike chain, his weapon expertise, his brawn and because he's reaching out and trying to get it attack his opponent at the far length of his chain, he's using balance to help him strike. So that all adds up to 4d6 plus 8. Drax hopes this is going to kill his opponent, because if it doesn't, he's going to leave him without any potential left at all, which is a very dangerous state to be in. When a character is attacked, they get to make a resistance action to defend themselves. And the definition of attack is, is very wide, so it covers obviously being melee attacked or range attacked, but it also includes things like a psionic attack or just being caught in the effects of an avalanche. They're all attacks because they all put the character at risk. The resistance action sets the score which the attacker has to beat in order to do damage, and it works just the same as any other type of action. So the defender uses potential to activate advantages, and those advantages have to be suitable, but has to be justified for the situation. If Drax is attacked by a melee weapon, then his spike chain is going to be perfect to defend himself with. He can use it to drive back his opponent, or just generally make it harder for his opponent to attack him. However, if Drax is attacked by a fireball, his spike chain isn't going to be any use at all. The amount of damage an attack does is the difference between the attacker's score and the defender's score. So if the attacker scores 15 and Drax in his defence only scores 10, Drax will take 5 points of damage. If the attacker scores equal or less than the defender score, there is no damage. This is why running out of potential is really bad news, because if you can't defend yourself, and if you've got no armour, you have to rely on the default uh, resistance. Well, resistance is 1, not 1d6, just 1. So even an attack of 2d6 can actually do quite a lot of damage to a defenceless opponent. When a character takes damage, they have to discard green life advantages. A discarded advantage is no longer available for use, so it can no longer be incorporated into any form of action. This is where the CP value of an advantage really becomes important. Because if Drax has taken 5 points of damage, he must discard 5 points worth of advantages. Now Drax has 4 advantages, Three of them, Society, Toughness and Balance, are worth 4 CP, and his Brawn is worth 7 CP. The problem is, Drax can't discard partial advantages, so he can't discard 5 points worth of his 7 point Brawn advantage. 
He has the choice. He either discards all of his brawn advantage or he discards two of his other advantages. Either way, he has to pay the five points of damage. As a player, there are times when it's better to give up one larger advantage than two smaller advantages, or times when it's better to give up two smaller advantages than one larger advantages. In this situation, Drax is going to give up two smaller advantages because he uses his brawn all the time in combat. That is his most useful advantage and he wants to keep hold of it for now. So Drax gets rid of his society and his toughness. To indicate which advantages have been discarded on the character sheet, we just put a simple cross through them or any other suitable mark. It doesn't matter as long as you know which ones are discarded. What happens when you lose all your life advantages depends very much on circumstances. Because the rule is, you must discard life advantages equal to or more than the amount of damage you've taken. So if Drax is on his final life advantage, Brawn, worth 7 CP, and he takes 5 points of damage, he can give up that life advantage and pay for the damage. He's still alive, he's still conscious, he has no life advantages left, but he's still active. But if Drax takes 8 points of damage, he cannot pay for all of that with his 7 CP life advantage. So in those circumstances, Drax is now unconscious and he's dying. Dying is not as bad as it sounds because there's no actual definition of death in the 66 RPG. The idea is redundant when there might be settings where you have a resurrection spell or settings where you can clone a character from a few cells of DNA and bring them back that way. Character death is left very much up to the game leader and the group as a whole, and depending on circumstances. A character who's just fallen into a, a volcano is pretty much dead. One who's just been stabbed a little bit too much, they can be recovered and healed. Healing is very much the reverse of getting hurt. The character needs to make some sort of healing action. Now that might come from a magic potion, or you might rely on the natural healing process. They take the action, they beat the resistance, and the amount they beat the resistance by is the amount of CP they can recover. And, like in taking damage, you can't recover half an advantage. You must recover all of an advantage.